Hello, every hello everyone. I'm Sade Davis, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Young Lawyers Division of the Entertainment and Sports Committee. And we're excited to kick off the bar year with our first event, discussing navigating entertainment and sports as people of color. Um, we have a great group for you today. Um, so we will start with introductions, we'll get into the discussion, and then we'll close with questions and a few announcements. So first, um, for the introductions, please give me a little bit about your background and how you broke into the industry. We'll start with Jaya Thomas. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jaya Thomas. I am a Los Angeles-based sports and entertainment lawyer. I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, went to college in upstate New York at Colgate University and law school in Washington, D.C. at the George Washington University School of Law. After graduating from law school, I worked at a big law firm in New York City for several years. Uh, before deciding I really wanted to work more heavily in the entertainment industry, especially TV and film. And so to do that, I figured I really needed to be in LA as opposed to New York. And so I ended up quitting my job in New York and buying a one-way ticket to LA um, where I didn't have a job and where I didn't know anybody and started from scratch. Um, fast forward to today, I now have my own practice uh, focused on sports and entertainment. On the entertainment side, I primarily work in TV, film, and digital. On the sports side, I primarily work with athletes who are at the intersection of sports and entertainment. So athletes who have their own production companies or who are content creators. I also do a little work in the intellectual property space as well. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor at UCLA, where I teach a course on copyright law and the entertainment industry. I also teach a seminar on how to start your own law practice. And I recently launched a new company called Diverse Representation. And the focus of this company is to increase the hiring and exposure of black attorneys, agents, managers, and publicists in the sports and entertainment industry. So we provide the first ever comprehensive directory of black attorneys, agents, managers, and publicists throughout the country. Um, and we also host various events as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jaya. Akalisha? Great, thank you. Hello everyone and thank you for having me. A special thank you to Sade and Tracy for putting this together. Um, my name is Kalisha Stewart and I'm heading into my fifth season as Associate Counsel for the Dallas Cowboys. I should probably start by saying that, you know, everything I say today, it's my own opinion. I'm not speaking for the Jones family or on behalf of the Dallas Cowboys, it's just me. Um, so how I got here, I'm from South Texas. I went to Texas A&M University for undergrad, went to Stanford for law school. And um, while in law school, I interned at Nike um, for two months at their headquarters in Beaverton, and then a year uh, virtually as an extern uh, for the remainder of 3L year. And then once I graduated, I moved back to Texas um, to start my career at Jones Day Dallas. Um, that same fall, my old boss from Nike came to town to go to a Cowboys game, and he invited me to join him. And then at that game, I met the Cowboys general counsel. And it was just so happened that it was at a time of really immense growth for the club. Um, we were relocating from our old home at Valley Ranch to our new headquarters um, and practice facility at the Star. And at that time, the general counsel was the only lawyer and he really needed some help. And so my old boss from Nike told the GC that, hey, you should really just hire Kalisha. And the GC said, well, yeah, maybe I will. Um, and so I was thinking that Jones Day could help uh, the Cowboys from a bandwidth perspective. And so uh, the GC and I stayed in touch. And then one morning I got a call and it was the GC asking if I was interested in doing a secondment. And for those who may not know, a secondment is basically an arrangement where a firm uh, loans an attorney to one of their clients. Um, and so basically I would go into work every day and the Cowboys were my only client. Um, so I said yes, and, and I pitched the idea to the managing partner of the Dallas office, who was basically like, what? Um, but she went with it. And um, so February of 2016, I started uh, working with the Cowboys and, and never really looked back. Um, the big lesson there for me is that with these types of jobs in sports and entertainment, you really never know what the best, the next opportunity is going to be or where it's going to come from. So it's really important to be open. I'm um, looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you, Kalisha. Ines? Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our panel today. My name is Ines Morales, 
and I am entering my third year at Sony Pictures Television. I am a director of business affairs and acquisitions within the networks department at Sony. So I essentially support and provide counsel to Sony's um, large portfolio of linear and nonlinear international networks. So I'm really working mostly with our international channels, our VOD services abroad. And originally I'm from Los Angeles and I went to undergrad in upstate New York at Cornell University. I came back to Los Angeles for law school knowing that I wanted to work in entertainment. I've always just had you know, an interest in it growing up in LA. It always seemed like the pinnacle of what we can do with our lives um, being in Los Angeles. And so I strategically chose my law school, Southwestern Law School, because it has a very strong entertainment program. And so I knew going into law school, I wanted to work in the entertainment field. And I just really snapped that into a bunch of different internships while I was in law school. I worked at Fox Sports Music, and then I interned at Spotify in New York. And so originally I thought I was going to be a music attorney. That's kind of what I was putting all my focus in. And then this opportunity came up at Sony and I interned with my department that I'm currently in now my entire third year of law school. Um, I kind of got my foot in the ground on television and I realized TV is really where it was at and where I, where I wanted to be at. And so I was lucky enough um, during my third year of law school, I actually received an offer from my department asking me to come back and work as a full-time attorney after I graduate from law school. So, so fortunate by the time I was, you know, March, April of my 3L year, I already had a job offer to be an attorney at a studio in Los Angeles, which was my dream that I had always been hoping for. And so I have been at Sony for two full years going on my third year now. Um, and it has just been so great working with so many international people. I've learned so much. And I think it's just really important if you're interested in the industry, you just have to get out there and break into it. So. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today and hearing what the, these other ladies have to say about everything. Thank you all. Um, as many of you mentioned, uh, your network is was very helpful in get breaking into the industry. Um, so what are some tips you have for young lawyers looking to break into sports entertainment? Um, I, I can start um, speaking on the sports side of the house. Um, one is I always encourage lawyers to uh, join the Sports Lawyers Association and ten, attend the yearly conference. Um, some folks I've seen um, set up informational interviews uh, in person with the different professionals that attend that conference. I think what's great about that conference is that it really is very well attended for, for by people across the um, sort of sports industry. So you've got in-house counsel there for teams and for leagues, um, but you also have um, lawyers that are in private practice, working in sports practices there. So it's a, it's a really great and informative uh, conference. And they also have content that's specific, specifically geared towards folks who are trying to break into the industry. So I think it has a lot of really great resources. And um, I know I've been asked to uh, do informational interviews with students and lawyers that are trying to break into the sports industry. And so it's, it's very common and it's great to get that face time. Um, speaking of informational interviews, I think that reaching out to people who are doing the job that you want in order to learn more about it is key. Um, if you do decide to take that route, it's important to do your homework first. Um, you know, see if they're speaking on panels or have written articles or blog posts or if there have been profiles about them. You know, the worst that can happen is they say no or they don't respond. Um, so it's it's really critical to to really understand what is this job that you're you know you're searching for. What does the day-to-day -day look like? And informational interviews are a great way to do that and to make connections. And yeah, to piggyback off that about doing your research, also just do your research on the person you're reaching out to, you know, before you reach out to them. I get a ton of emails every day from people who are, make it obvious that they haven't done any research on me or what I actually do. Um, you know, I have some students or recent graduates who email me and they start their email off by saying, hello, Mr. Thomas. And it's like, they don't even know that I'm a woman or, you know, they ask me about how to get into the music industry. And that's not something that's not an area that I focus on at all, which lets me know you didn't really do your research. So before you reach out to anyone, you know, definitely do your due diligence, do your research. And one thing I would recommend is also try to find something you have in common with that person before you reach out to them, because I think that always helps. 
Um, I get, like I said, I get a ton of emails every day from people and I honestly just don't have time to respond to all of them. But the ones that I am more prone to respond to are the ones who mention something that we do have in common. Maybe they're also from Ohio or maybe they also went to law school in DC, you know, sometimes if there's kind of that common thread, um, someone will be more prone to respond because oftentimes a lot of us are just inundated with emails. And so figure out a way to, to kind of stick out in your email or correspondence when you are reaching out to somebody. And the other thing I would say when you reach out to someone, be specific. Um, there are a lot of people who sent emails with, you know, and all the email says is, hey, can you help me be an entertainment lawyer? Or, hey, can I pick your brain on entertainment law? And that's such a big ask and it's so vague as well. Um, so, you know, really think through what you are trying to get from that person and be very specific in whatever it is that you want from them. Um, the big as, the big, you know, can you help me do this and that? It's like, I don't even know you, you know? So just be like very specific in your ask, very concise and concrete with regards to what it is you're looking for. Um, and then also one thing I want to mention is going to events. Um, you know, there are a ton of conferences, not in person right now, but there are a ton of conferences and events in the sports and entertainment space. And one thing I would recommend is going to a lot of those events by yourself. I think oftentimes we go with our friends and you know people that we're, we're really cool with, um, but then sometimes that just makes you stick to those people all night or all day, and it doesn't really force you to come out of your comfort zone to meet new people. So I always recommend going to events, going to conferences by yourself, um, because it really forces you to come out of your shell and meet new people. Yeah, and just to piggyback off of what both um, both the ladies have said, I think as a young lawyer, I'm probably the most fresh out of law school out of the three of us. I think don't discredit your classmates. If you're currently in law school, like really pay attention to some of your classmates because especially if you're coming from a law school that's in a major city that focuses on entertainment, these are going to be your colleagues one day. And so while networking outside to get jobs is great, don't discredit your classmates because I can say just while I was in law school, I was able to help some of my classmates get internships in places that I previously had internships in. Or to this day, you know, we're about three years out of law school now. I get calls up from my friends saying, hey, my firm or hey, my studio is looking for a new lawyer and I think you'd be a great fit. And so it really comes from that base level to also help you break in. So network, you know, network, go to these events. Also reach out to, um, you know, either alumni from your law school that are working in the field that you're interested in. Reach out to lawyers in the field that you're interested in. But don't discredit your classmates as well. Um, the entertainment and sports industry is a tiny field. And so you're all going to be colleagues one day. And it's really important to keep those relationships strong from the time you're in law school and keep them, um, you know, keep in contact with these classmates after you graduate as well. And one more thing I want to mention about just like networking. Also, don't just network with other lawyers. Um, I think sometimes as attorneys or law students, we just kind of think very linear um, and think we should only network and get to know other attorneys or, you know, other law students. Think outside the box and just also network with people who are just in the space, period. Um, you know, a lot of the people I work with now or a lot of my clients didn't come from necessarily other lawyers, but maybe they came from talent agents. Maybe they came from publicists. Maybe they came from talent themselves. So, when you think about networking, don't just think about it in the sense of networking with other attorneys or other legal professionals. Think about networking across the board, just period, within sports and entertainment. Those are all great tips um, to kind of take a shift. Um, a lot has happened in the past few months. It's been a very challenging year. Um, and the topic of equality and racial justice has been prevalent throughout sports and entertainment. Um, so how have companies and different leaders in the space really stood out to you in the way they've responded? Um, I have a few. Um, so there are a few organizations and leagues that I think have done a really great job. Um, so first, I'll, I have to give a shout out to the WNBA. Um, and I cite them first because they've been vocal on social issues and have been socially conscientious well before the summer. I mean, they're, they're organized and they also have commitment from their leadership and their star athletes. And so I really commend them on that. Um, I've also really admired Arthur Blank and the Atlanta Falcons. I, I think he really gets it and has an appreciation for these issues. And he actually just came out with a new book called Good Company. If you want to learn more about his sort of business ethos and valuing both profit and, and purpose. 
Um, and then I'm, I'm in Dallas. And so I would, I, I think I'd be really remiss if I didn't mention the Mavericks. Um, they have incredible leadership in St. Marshall who's their CEO is a black woman. And, you know, they have an action plan and they've put it out to the public. You can see it on their website. And, and they also have just so much engagement from their employees. And so as a fellow Dallas sports club, we really admire what the Mavericks are doing. Um, and really the, the NBA as a whole, I think is, um, does a great job and their, uh, their athletes have such an incredible voice and power. Um, so that, those are some of the organizations I've really been admiring. Yeah, and just to piggyback off that, I think um, with everything that happened this summer with the Black Lives Matter protest, there was a lot of um, statements that were essentially released and it almost became a point where your silence um, spoke louder than if you made a statement. And so, you know, we had all these broad statements out there, but I think media companies, it was really important to take a look at what media companies were saying and not only what their statements were, but what were their action items. And I think, you know, there were some really large media companies out there that really came down with you know, very straightforward action items, like, hey, we're going to donate $100 million to various like equality and equity funds that we can find, you know, we're going to help um, diversify our, you know, our workplace, we're going to support these inclusion matters. And I think just looking at those going forward is a big portion of that. I know 2020 has kind of been crazy. And so maybe these initiatives aren't going to come around tomorrow. But I think having these long term plans in place is really important going forward. Um, and I think one more thing to mention, um, just something that really has always stood out to me is working in the television and, you know, the studio space is companies and actors themselves really have a lot of power. And I think that's really important to note um, when you're like an entertainment lawyer. We sometimes forget that these people themselves carry a lot of power and they carry a lot of weight. And so I remember back in 2018, this word inclusion writer was thrown around and it was the first time people were starting talking about it. I think Michael B. Jordan might have been the first one to really do this. And he basically said, hey, you want me in your movie? You want me in your film? Well, the people behind the camera and the people in front of the camera need to represent what society looks like. So you need to have X percent of women behind the camera and in front of the camera. You need to have X percent of minority people working on the film. You need to have X percent of people from the LGBTQ community. And I think actors taking a stance and saying, I'm including this inclusion writer as part of my contract and I won't work with you unless you agree to it, has so much power. And so going forward, I think we need to see more of that. We need to see more people adopting these inclusion writers and really taking a stance. And it's unfortunate that they almost have to force studios and force the hands of certain people, but if they have the power to do that, I think that's really important. And it's good for us to look at these things going forward and saying, you know, who's sort of leading the industry here. So just things to consider. Yeah, I think more and more actors are gonna to continue to utilize inclusion writers, which I think is a great step. Um, one thing that I would like to see more actors do is make sure that their own teams are inclusive though. Um, it's kind of difficult for a lot of actors to tell studios to be diverse when that talent's own team isn't diverse at all. So that's something I would personally like to see moving forward um, for more talent to actually have diversity within their own agents, attorneys, financial advisors, their own teams. Um, and, and with regards to other organizations and companies that are doing a good job, um, I think it's still too early to tell who's actually doing a good job. I think we'll have to kind of circle back on that a year from now. Um, I think a lot of organizations are off to a good start um, but I think time will, will really tell. And one thing that I am hoping with regard, with regard to a lot of organizations and companies is that they don't just throw money at outside organizations and outside social justice programs, but they also work on their own organizations internally. Um, there's a lot of work that a lot of the leagues themselves need to do before they just kind of start throwing money at all these other programs. Um, so I hope a lot of these leagues and companies take a look internally as well and start making some changes um, within their own organization. Very true. Um, it's, you all have made great points and we do have a lot, uh, a long way to go. Um, but the, the items that you've identified are definitely things that can be pushed forward. Um, so as we've been dealing with everything this year and this summer, uh, we may be turning to others to kind of cope and to um, express ourselves. Um, and so mentors can be a great source for that. Um, so have you had any mentors during your career and how they've been helpful to you and how that relationship developed? 
Yeah, so I can start on this one. I think um, for me, I'm a little bit different where I've never really had any formal mentors. You know, I talk to some people and they have that one person that they can go to for everything in their life. And I've never really had that. Um, and I don't know why it is. It just maybe hasn't come up or I haven't found the person yet that I really, you know, want to latch on to. But I think what I tend to do is I tend to build really strong relationships with my supervisors. And so throughout my time in law school, I was fortunate enough to have really amazing women supervisors um, throughout my internships. And so those really became my mentors. You know, they helped me through my internships, but beyond that, they were the people that I can turn to when I was applying for jobs and saying, hey, can you be my reference? Or they would reach out to me and say, hey, I see this great opportunity, maybe not at my company, but another company and my friend works there, are you interested? And so I think it's really important to kind of foster those relationships. And also for the young um, law students out there or the young lawyers, if you had professors in law school, if you can find like one or two that can act as a mentor or help you through law school, those are also great resources to have um, when it comes time to, you know, looking for jobs, asking for references. And on top of that, these are the people, especially if they're in your career, if you're, they're in the, your field of career that you're looking to get into, these are the people that when you do get a job offer, you can come to them and say like, hey, this is my offer. This is what they're offering me for the salary. Do you think that's fair? And they can help you negotiate that things. And so people who are working in the industry really know, you know, what's a base starting point. And those are the questions that I had when I was starting out. So I really found my mentors um, really just in past supervisors that I had as internships. I, I can go next. So um, yeah, I've, I've had some really great mentors and um, they've all actually been white men. And I mentioned that because I think it's so critical for women and people of color to not limit yourself to mentors that look like you. Um, you know, I'm so happy to hear it. And as that you had some wonderful uh, women supervisors that really nurtured you, but not every organization has a lot of people of color or women in leadership roles. And so, you know, being open to having a mentorship relationship with folks that don't look like you will only benefit you. Um, the way I've cultivated relationships with, with these guys, um, they've all been my bosses, is um, for me to do really good work. And we, that built a foundation of trust that was based on the fact that they knew I was working hard for them and that I was trying to make their lives easier. And then from there, when we have that trust, just showing an interest in them as whole people. So even though we come from different backgrounds, there still is a lot of common ground to be, ha to be had there. So it's a little different than how the mentorship relationship might form if I were like a white guy that played hockey on the weekends with my boss. That's not how we became friends and, and, and that sort of relationship, but it's still, what we have is still very powerful. Um, I don't mean to advocate that lawyers should just sit at their desk and like put their heads down and hope somebody notices that how hard they're working. But I do think um, that working hard in tandem with um, putting an effort to get to know, um, you know, get to know people and develop relationships um, can be really, really effective way at combating that sort of, oh, there's an old boys club that I, you know, it's hard to break into. Thank you both. Um, and Kalisha, as you mentioned, um, allies are extremely important. Um, so what does allyship look like to you? Um, and how can you um, promote allies to support young attorneys of color in the industry? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one and then, and then pass it over. Um, so allyship to me, I think, really looks like empathy and caring, um, caring about the issue and seeing it as as your issue too, um, not just something for people of color to solve. Um, I think the biggest thing allies can do to support young lawyers is, you know, taking the call. And, and by that, I mean, when a lawyer or student reaches out to you for an informational interview, provided they've done their, their homework, as Chaya mentioned, uh, respond. Um, if there's a job opening that an ally thinks would be a good fit for a young lawyer they know, uh, recommend them, uh, take those steps. Um, I think the other big thing allies can do is validate the experiences and feelings of people of color to other white people. Um, you know, when you hear an off-color joke, question it. You know, why is that funny? Uh, when you hear a casually racist remark, challenge it. 
you know, when you see people at work being treated unfairly based on their race or their gender, call it out in a way that makes sense based on the situation and your role in the company. I don't think it can really be understated how valuable an ally's voice can be in standing up to racism. You know, when an ally says something that is not okay, that has an element of objectivity and adds weight and it can help the message get across. And that's a really powerful tool for, for an ally to, to have and to wield effectively. Any other thoughts? I mean, I really agree with what Kalisha said. I think you put it very eloquently. Um, and I think being an ally, I feel sometimes I am a person of color. I am Latina and Hispanic, but you know, I'm not necessarily, a like I'm not a black person. So when the Black Lives Matter movement came out, I was an ally on that part. And I think a big part of it is listening to your colleagues and listening to what they have to say and really knowing your space. And so sometimes that means giving your platforms to others. And so if you just listen to what other people have to say, but you're not really doing anything to lift them up, then you're not really helping the cause at all. And so I noticed, um, at least for me, I remember, you know, we had the Blackout Tuesday day and everyone was just posting on social media and it was like, great, but I've never actually heard you in person t speak about this before. And so it was a little jarring to see some people that I knew who I didn't know were necessarily allies or people that supported the cause posting this. And so I think just be mindful about how you are an ally is really important also. Like, kind of feeding into the Instagram movement isn't the right way necessarily to do that. I think it's important to put, um, to put face to the cause, but also it's important to listen and to teach yourself and to, you know, have empathy, like Kalisha said, and really just learn, you know, listening to these people's stories and hearing what happens. And, you know, I think in our next question, we're going to talk about microaggressions, but I think especially today in the industry, it's so important to call people out um, when you see it in the right and appropriate way. And I think being an ally, if you can provide that support and that voice to, um, you know, your colleagues, I think that's really important and what we really need today. Right. Microaggressions um, are a, a very important topic. So how do you approach difficult conversations with allies? And how do you navigate microaggressions as the new colleague or the new face on the Zoom call? Um, and how do solo practitioners and entrepreneurs in this space navigate this? I guess I can start this one also. I think um, personally, I am a younger attorney. And in the beginning, you know, I would sometimes hear things and I didn't know if it was my place to call it out or not. But I think, you know, the longer I've been at a company or the, long, the more comfortable I feel um, within my own space, I feel like it is my duty to really just call people out on when they say something that's not okay. I think it's okay to say, hey, you know what you just said um, is a little bit closed-minded or did you actually mean to offend my culture group by saying that? I think that's totally fine. I think sometimes people will get very defensive when you call them out on these microaggressions and maybe they didn't know that what they were saying was a microaggression or maybe they just, you know, thought that they were making a funny joke or, you know, they were just playing the stereotypes or something of that sort. But I think in today's world, you really have to be able to say like, hey, that's not okay or, do you realize what you just said and do you understand why that's not something that is appropriate to stay in the workplace? I think that's where we kind of need to see everything sort of leading when it comes to microaggressions. Um, as Kalisha mentioned, it really is based on the situation, you know, also know where you are in the company, also know who you're speaking to um, when it comes to higher authorities. Um, you know, even today, I'm not sure if I would be comfortable calling out someone who is a significant higher authority than me. Thankfully, I haven't encounter that. But I think with people of your peers and your colleagues, if you see something and you're not okay with it, I think you should stand up and say something about it. So before we discuss breaking into the industry, so once you're in, um, how do you handle being the only one in the room? And um, how do you still maintain your authentic self? Um, I, I can, I can take this one. I think um, that self-awareness is really key, you know, being aware of your audience. Um, in my job and in many of your jobs as lawyers, having good relationships with my clients is essential for my ability to be effective. So I need them to trust me. I need them to want to talk to me. Um, you know, I need them to come to me so I can help solve their problems. So in interacting at work, 
um, that's something that's on the forefront of my mind. And by having good relationships, it gives you the flexibility to say the hard things when it's really important. Kind of like Inez said, you know, if there's something that, you know, you just can't let, you know, brush off your shoulder, if you have a foundation of trust and a good relationship with your colleagues, those conversations are much easier to have. Um, so I don't necessarily feel inauthentic when I connect differently to my white male stadium manager than I do to my best friend from law school, who's a black woman. You know, I think it's about being self-aware and using your influence effectively um, and, and having confidence that, you know, how you are in the boardroom and, and in your meetings, it is, it is a part of you, even if you don't necessarily, um, you know, treat it the way that you would if you were, you know, around all people of color. Yeah, and I think to Kalisha's point, I think a confidence really comes into play. And sometimes when you walk into a room and you're the only, you know, person of color, it kind of takes a toll on your confidence. And you're sitting there thinking, you know, do I belong here? Um, am I the minority hire of the group? And so I think really you have to be able to have confidence in yourself and know that you're there for a reason and really understand that your skill set and your background and your culture and everything that makes up who you are is the reason you're in that room today. And so use your voice as best as you can. And don't think that, you know, just because I'm in a boardroom and I'm dressing a certain way and I'm acting a certain way, I'm inauthentic to the person that I am on the weekend. We're all the same person and we're all made up of these different parts. And sometimes we do separate our professional lives from our personal selves, but you know, we're all the same person at the end of the day. So just have confidence in who you are and have confidence in your ability to be there and just know that you deserved your seat at the table also. And I think from the entrepreneur side, I think one of the good things about being an entrepreneur is that I can pretty, I mean, I can be my authentic self 1000% of the time. I don't have to fit in, into any specific company culture. I am my own culture, you know, since, since I run my own companies. Um, so at this point, that hasn't really been an issue in terms of me um, having to worry about being my authentic self, um, I'm my authentic self every day. And the good thing is, you know, when I'm working with clients, um, I'm able to be my authentic self, they're able to be their authentic self, and it, it works really well. And so that's just one of the great things about owning your own company, you kind of get to create whatever type of workplace culture or, you know, um, atmosphere that you want to operate in. Thank you all. Um, so a lot of people over these past few months due to shifts in the industry might be changing companies or transitioning into new areas. Um, so what key things should young lawyers be looking for when they're evaluating companies um, to ensure that they have an inclusive and equitable environment? I think a big one. Oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, one thing I was going to say is just ask, ask the questions. Be very direct with your questions. Um, I have a lot of colleagues who have been moving um, in-house this summer to different organizations, different uh, companies. One, all black, a lot of them are black women. And uh, one thing that they've done throughout the interview process is just ask directly, um, you know, what are your diversity numbers? What what is the makeup of the company across the board? So I think that's important um, to just ask those very specific questions. If you really do want to get a sense of how inclusive the company is and um, what they're doing with regards to kind of diversity and inclusion, ask those questions, ask for some hard numbers, ask for some hard statistics and ask, you know, what are they doing um, in the space and kind of what resources are available to um, employees of color. Yeah, to piggyback off that, I think, um, you know, also ask about employee resource groups. I think a lot of big companies nowadays have groups and maybe, you know, when you're in your interview process, ask if you can speak to members of the employee resource group, see what they're doing um, to sort of further the initiative. Um, also look at what other, like other minor aspects of the company is doing. Do they have a company matching program? You know, things of that nature. Like if it's really important for you to donate your time, are they going to also like match that time that you gave? 
how, what are the volunteer opportunities? I know at my company, um, we have really great volunteer opportunities that give back to the community. And during, um, not now because of COVID, but when I was at work, I was able to work one-on-one -on -one with different volunteer opportunities. During my work hours, it's not like I had to take time off of work. They were very, um, you know, just amenable to us saying like, hey, I'm gonna take two hours off every Thursday to go work at this program. And they said, that's totally fine. And they would even match my hours by giving money back to the organization. So look at things of that nature, just ask, and like Jai said, really just ask the questions. You wanna know what the culture is at your company, ask the questions and see how they're really supporting diversity and inclusion. inclusion. I think I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think in addition to asking the questions, um, you know, really look at, at the company profile. What does their leadership look like, both in terms of diversity, do they have any diversity in the C-suite, um, but also do they have someone dedicated to diversity and inclusion or social justice that is at the top or at least near it? Um, if not, have the executives been vocal about supporting or not supporting these issues? Those are things I would look at. And this one, it's kind of out there, but I would always want to know what sort of family leave policies does the company have? And this is my personal opinion and, and as someone without children, but compassionate family and parental leave policies strike me as a litmus test of sorts for how dedicated a company is to talent retention and, and inclusivity, particularly for women. Um, so that's something that I, I find important. And then, um, you know, if it's available to you talking with people at the company about their experiences, as Ines said, particularly those that you're not interviewing with. I um, mean, as Inez mentioned earlier, um, discussion around pay equity um, is important as a young lawyer and transparency isn't always there. Um, so as people of color, as women of color, I should say, do you feel uh, pay equity has been an issue for you or your peers um, during your career and how did you or your peers navigate it? And how do solo practitioners and entrepreneurs in this space um, navigate this issue as well? Yeah, I think this is still an issue that comes up today. Um, you know, speaking with my peers, speaking with my friends that I graduated from law school with, it's really interesting, um, especially if you have a lot of friends in the same industry. You, if you're comfortable with your friends, you know, share your pay. I think at this point, if you're a young lawyer, be super transparent with your friends. Like, just ask them, how much are you getting paid in your, in your job? And they can ask you the same thing. And it's really important to know what your worth is. And I think it's hard to kind of put a number on that without knowing what other people are getting. And so, you know, I think if you have male colleagues, which, you know, can be our allies in this sense, if you have a male colleague that you're close to and you're comfortable with, and he's pretty much on the same field as you, and in terms of like how many years of experience, and if you're comfortable, ask him, you know, say, hey, I was just wondering how much are you getting paid? Because I'm a little unsure if we're making the same amount here. And then from that, you can take that back to your supervisors if you find out that there is a discrepancy. And if you find out the discrepancy is probably based on gender and not other external factors such as years of experience, um, you know, in that sense, and really try to fight for yourself. I think it's, it's 2020 and we really need to stand up for ensuring that women are getting paid the same as men. And it's kind of ridiculous that this is still an issue, but it is. And I can say from the entertainment industry, I've heard this from many peers that this is an issue. So, you know, I think transparency is really important. It's a bit taboo, but if you want to ensure that you're getting paid what you really are worth, you should just feel free to ask people that you're comfortable with. Yeah, and um, I, I would say I've seen it as well. And I think this is an area where it can be really beneficial to have a sponsor in your organization, especially if they have influence. And a sponsor is a little bit different from a mentor, although they can be the same person. But it's by sponsor, I mean someone who is really invested in your professional development and is willing to advocate for you. Um, they can help you figure out how to strategically advocate for yourself and also advocate on your behalf. Um, so by strategically advocate for yourself, let's say, um, just as Ines said in her example, you find out that a male colleague is doing the same work as you, same experience, um, but there's a pay discrepancy. You know, maybe when it's time for you to negotiate your salary, you mentioned that, you know, you've done research and the market for this position, both outside the company and within, seems to be at X. Here's why it makes sense for me uh, to get, you know, up to X. 
Um, I think that it's really important when you're negotiating your salary or pay increases that you have the receipt, so to speak, you know, be able to show the value that you have brought to the organization. Um, this is not a time to be shy, especially when you have your track record to back it up. Um, another thing I'll note is that changing jobs can sometimes be the best way to get the salary that you deserve. There's been a lot of studies that show that um, employees that stay with the company, the same company for long periods of time tend to make less than those who, I'm not advocating job hopping, but that, that switch to different jobs because there is you know, a bit of a, a market out there that you're probably not getting if you've been at the same company for 15 years and are getting a 3% increase each year. So that's another thing to really think about is you know, if I'm at a company where I'm not getting what based on my research is a market rate, maybe it's time to look elsewhere. Um, oh, and there's actually anyone? one more thing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. There was one more thing I wanted to mention really quickly. Um, I'm really excited about states adopting rules that prevent potential employers from asking about salary history. Um, California is one of them, but there are many others. Um, that's important because it helps break the cycle of pay discrimination. So if you're being underpaid at your current role and then you move on, um, and your comp the new company is not allowed to ask you about your salary history, it doesn't tie you down to what you're making at your old company. So um, I think that's really important. And um, But yeah, it, it, it does still exist. But rules like that are really helpful in combating that. And from get a solo side, um, I mean, obviously you get to select what your own rate is when you are working with clients. And one thing I would recommend for any attorneys who are thinking about going the solo route, starting their own practice, is um, one mistake that I made and that I know a lot of other solos make is when you're starting out, you just want clients. So you'll just take whatever they're able to pay you. Um, I know when I first started out, if a client was like, you know, I can only pay hundred dollars, you know, I was like, okay, well, we'll, we'll just figure out a way to make it work because you want a client you want, you know, you want to be working. And so that was one of the biggest mistakes I made and a big mistake that I know other solos make. Um, people are just so hungry to have clients. So they'll, they'll just accept anything at any rate. And honestly, it always ends up being more of a headache um, than it's worth. So from the jump, even though it is going to be difficult to kind of build up your clientele, I would say, you know, set your rate, don't waver on that rate um, and keep it throughout and um, stick to it. You know, as a solo, people are going to come at you all the time looking to negotiate your rate, looking for, for discounts um, and know your worth and just stay strong in whatever your rates are and whatever it is you're charging. Um, so a lot, as I've mentioned uh, multiple times, a lot has happened this year. Um, and so how are you balancing work, family, friends, um, the weight of everything that's been happening um, and still practice self-care? Um, and how do entrepreneurs, solo practitioners, um, lawyers with direct reports, how, how have you been navigating this? Um, so for me, um, self-care, Exercise is a big part of my own self-care, um, and I, I really like to make sure to make time for that. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that um, the key to happiness is really through your social connections. So I've been trying to invest in those relationships as much as possible and as safely as possible. Um, and then when it comes to my direct report, it's really about communication, you know, checking in with her often um, and making sure that, you know, she's getting the an amount of work that works for her um, situation and her family and her life. And, you know, really understanding that, you know, particularly when it comes to direct reports during this time, that you're, you have to look at them as, as whole people now more than ever and see things as a long game. So there may be times where I'm less productive or our direct reports are less productive, but um, it's in light of the full situation, you know, it's better for them to be taking care of themselves and, and be happy as much as possible than, you know, getting the level of productivity that we had on March 10th, 2020. Um, so really, I think what it comes down to is giving ourselves and giving our direct reports uh, grace to kind of move through this strange time as effectively and safely and happily as possible. Yeah, to balance what Kalisha said, I think for me, um, 
you know, having a routine is really important. I know we're, you know, I don't even know how many months in we're into this thing already, but you know, in the beginning it was like, I was so on top of, you know, waking up, getting my morning coffee, sitting down at my desk, doing my work. And sometimes that changes. And sometimes, you know, it's always hard to keep that routine. But I think if you have like a base routine that you can fall back on, it's really important. You know, I also take great pride in, you know, just going out and taking a walk for your coffee. If it's the middle of the day and normally you're just going to make yourself a pot of coffee at home. If you have a closed coffee shop and it's safe to do so, go out and get your coffee. You know, just being outside can really help a lot um, during this time. And I think also, you know, staying connected with your family and friends, social distancing, of course, but also I was talking to Sade earlier about um, summertime is really important for team building with your colleagues. And so it's usually the fun time where we all go out and do all of our fun team building activities, whether it's like we do an escape room where we go to, you know, a day at the beach. And so connect, stay connected with your colleagues. I know a lot of us are on daily Zoom calls and that can get a little tiring, but you know, even if it's like attend a happy hour, I know sometimes these things are a little kooky and we're always like, oh, there's a virtual happy hour, but it's always nice to see your colleagues outside of the work environment. And I think um, for me, at least, the, the thing I miss the most right now in 2020 is just, you know, the water cooler talk, being able to go up to one of my colleagues' desk and sit down and have a conversation about how was your weekend, um, things like that that we're really missing on a day to day. So, you know, keep connected to your friends and families, but also keep connected to your colleagues as well. And I definitely have not done a great job of self-care <laughs> since March. Um, but it's something I'm working on. Um, one thing I have started doing over the past couple of months is meditating for the first time. Um, so that's been really helpful. And also just getting out every day. Um, <clears throat> I try to go for a walk or run um, every day as well. It's about an hour, hour and a half, and that's been helpful. Um, and I also think to piggyback off what you just said about keeping a routine, I think that's really helpful as well um, because sometimes the days can just get, you know, we can just get lost in these days now. So I think having a routine and having a schedule really helps as well. But um, I admittedly have not been great with self-care. And um, yeah, it's something that is it's an ongoing process. I've been taking COVID very seriously. So I've been in the house for the most part. Um, haven't really been meeting up with people at all. Um, but definitely connecting with people on FaceTime and Zoom um, and things like that have been great. And the other thing about just being an entrepreneur, it's also you know, we don't really, it's not really like a, kind of like a nine to five with entrepreneurship. You're kind of always on, there's always something that needs to be done. And so that's been difficult as well. Kind of trying to find the time to really completely turn things off um, has been difficult. So self-care thing, it's ongoing, still figuring it out. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing. Oh yeah. And I would just like to piggyback off of that. I think it's so important right now is set a time for yourself if you can where you just turn off your computer. I think all of us, we constantly have our computers on, we have our work phones constantly going, and you really have to be strict with yourself and say, okay, it's 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock, whatever time it is, shut it down and just don't look at it again. Because if you look at it and you're like, well, I'm home, my computer's right there, it's so easy for me to send this one email, but that's your time. And that's your time to really, you know, self-care and be by yourself. So shut your computer down, shut your phones off, you know, you'll get to it in the morning. Everyone knows we're kind of working these weird hours right now. It's not you know, everything with everything going on, things can wait. Definitely. And as we've all been at home, kind of creating that separation, um, it's kind of become like that line has become a little blurred. So I'm glad you guys are at least have some, some things in practice or motivated to get um, some changes in your life. Um, but thank you all for those tips, because I know as we reach month, who knows, um, it's, is definitely something that people want to have some new strategies. Um, so as we've seen companies respond, as we've seen um, how different leaders in the field have responded, um, do you think we're at a point uh, where significant lasting change can happen? Um, and how do young lawyers continue to move that conversation forward? So I do think um, we're at an, an inflection point at, as a country. Um, for the first time in my lifetime, and I think much longer, it is more of a liability for companies to not come out and condemn racism. Um, and as mentioned the same earlier at the top of the call that, you know, silence is just not acceptable. And so I, I think that is really meaningful. 
um, with the George Floyd murder um, earlier this summer, uh, I noticed that it touched um, white people and, and non-black people, I should say, um, in a way that I hadn't seen before with all of the other countless murders that had happened. And so that alone made me feel optimistic that some people are starting to get it. And um, so that, that makes me happy. Um, I'm not saying that I think racism will be solved. Um, you know, if it were easy, it would have been done by the, you know, countless heroes that have been working and dedicating their lives to doing it for years. Um, but I think we will take steps forward. Um, in terms of how to continue the conversation, you know, um, the work that I do um, at the Cowboys, we've been, um, you know, really focused on, you know, figuring out where our voice is in this conversation. And one thing that we've done this summer is um, launch an employee resource group um, for, called the Fellowship for Black Employees and for allies that care about social justice and inclusion. And one thing that I really focus on with, with our folks is that, you know, we need to celebrate the wins where they come. And, and so there may not be, you know, a complete overhaul by next year of racism and systemic racism, but I do think that there are organizations and people um, in positions of influence who are understanding the issue better and feel a duty to uh, make changes where they didn't feel the duty before. And so I do think that, you know, we're on a, a better path than we were this time last year. And I think I'm cautiously optimistic. As I said earlier, I think it's still very early. We're only a couple months into this to really tell. Um, and I, I think the difference with regard to George, George Floyd as opposed to previous murders is that this summer we were all stuck in the house. So, you know, we were all glued to CNN. We were all, you know, watching what was going on play by play. Whereas in the past, you know, our lives were so busy, we were still out, we were still doing things. So I think the climate is a little different right now. And I don't know it, how things are going to look when our lives do go back to normal. You know, let's say 20, early 2021, when there is a vaccine, and we all are back in the office, and we're running around, and we're doing errands, and we're going on vacation, will we be as committed to these issues as we are today when we're all literally stuck in the house? I don't know. Um, and I don't know if I feel confident to say yes. Um, I, I just think we're in a unique time with a lot of different factors at play here. So I think time will still tell. Uh, but I think, you know, to really push the needle forward, I think we're going to need a lot more drastic changes. Um, I think companies just bringing on DNI people or creating uh, ERG groups, I think that's a great start. But is that going to be revolutionary at the end of the day? No. Um, and so I still think there are a lot of drastic big steps that need to be made um, and time will tell if that does happen. Um, and with regards to kind of what, what young lawyers can do, I, I don't think there's a playbook with regards to what young, each young lawyer can do because I think we all have our own lane. Um, so, you know, one attorney may be really interested in this particular aspect of, it, of these issues. One may be interested in this specific aspect. So, I don't have kind of a one size fit all answer to what can young lawyers do. I think young attorneys should think about what are they most passionate about and kind of what um, changes would they like to see and figuring out a pathway to help get to those changes. So I think it's an, I think it's all individual. Um, and I think it just depends on the young lawyer. Yeah, just to piggyback, I think those are all great points. And I think just to piggyback, you know, when the George Floyd murder happened and all the Black Lives Matter protests were going on. There were so many action items that came out, things that people can do. Where can you donate your money? Where can you donate your time? And so really, you know, ask yourself, what can I give to move this, you know, keep this momentum going and keep this movement moving forward? And so if you have money to donate, go ahead and do that. If you have time to donate, go ahead and do that. I think there are so many great opportunities out there for lawyers that we don't know about. I remember when the protests were happening in Los Angeles, um, I had a few friends reach out to me that were lawyers and said, hey, there's these lawyer groups that are going out and helping um, to get the protests out of jail. They were helping, you know, various aspects of that nature. And so if you can donate your time, donate your money, I think that's also a big portion of that. So just, you know, 
do what you can to keep it help to keep it moving forward. Thank you all for your thoughts. And so for our final question, um, do you have any last tips or anything that you wish you would have known as a young lawyer in sports and entertainment? I guess there's I a lot I wish I would have known. Um, <laughs> yeah. I but to be concise, as concise as possible, one thing I would say is, um, or one piece of advice I would give is don't be afraid to create your own opportunities. Um, you know, I think while you're looking for that dream job um, in sports and entertainment, whatever that dream job may be, there's still a lot you can do in the meantime in terms of creating your own opportunities. So I would say don't just sit on your laurels waiting for your dream job to come because honestly, it may not come tomorrow, it may not come this year, it may not come next year. But in the meantime, there are ways in which you can still continue to create opportunities um, for yourself in the space, whether it's starting a new organization or writing articles on specific topics in sports and entertainment. I think always be thinking about how can I create my own opportunities while I wait for, you know, this other opportunity uh, to come around. And the other thing um, I would say is, geez, there's so much. <laughs> um, I, I would say that's the biggest thing. Um, and let me kind of think through the other items as well. And I'll let the other speakers go and I'll kind of figure out how to be more concise with my other, other points. Yeah, and I can take you back off of that. I think um, one of the biggest advice or, you know, tidbits I can offer to young attorneys or people that are still in law school is don't be discouraged. Breaking into the entertainment industry is very hard. It takes a lot of grit and a lot of just time applying to so many places. I know if you're a law student, um, internships are so important, but don't think that you can apply to five and you'll hear back from all five. That's usually not the case. When I was in law school, I would be applying to like 40, 50 places. And I know that sounds crazy, but you might only hear back from four and then maybe you'll get offered one. And so really just don't be discouraged. Apply to every opportunity that you see if you think it'll be a good fit for you. And also apply early. I know it's only September, but start looking now for the summer. These opportunities that come up for summer internships, you know, if you wait until December, they might be gone already. Look, start looking September, October, and, you know, keep a running list of all the places you might be interested in and check their websites. You know, if you're interested in working at studios, sometimes these opportunities come up really early in the fall. And so just constantly be checking and keep track of all the places you've applied to really you know, make an organized list for yourself of what places you apply to, where you still want to apply to, and just keep track of everything. I think that's really important. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. My, my piece of advice dovetails with what, um, you know, Jaya and Inez said. So I wanted to first just acknowledge that it is a grind. Um, there are many fewer jobs than there are qualified candidates, um, and that's hard. And so just acknowledging that, um, you know, if you want to be in sports, I think a big thing is being willing to move to different markets. Um, so I'm in DFW. There are less than 10 sports attorneys, um, you know, working at, at teams um, because there are only, you know, a handful of teams. And this is a pretty big sports market. Um, so, you know, being willing to leave your, um, you know, your city for a sports opportunity, a lot of times that does come with the territory with working in sports. Um, the other thing I wanted to say really dovetails with what Jaya was saying is that, you know, really soul search about what it is about this industry, whether it's sports or entertainment, um, that compels you and see if there's a way to accomplish that in your current role. Um, you know, if you, if you want to be a sports attorney because you want to be an expert on um, sports related issues or, or you love basketball and you want to be an expert on the CBA or, you know, anything like that. That's something that you can do, you know, when you're in law school or, um, you know, as a lawyer, start writing. If what you really like about the prospect of being a sports attorney is that you get to go to all the games, um, you know, get some season tickets and fulfill it that way, you know, but I, I kid, but really, you know, what is it about this industry that, that compels you so much and, and how can you find ways and touch points to accomplish that where you are now? And one other thing I wanted to say, um, this will be my last point because I do have a lot, is also know the industry, study the industry. Um, I think a lot of um, attorneys, they just kind of want to look at sports and entertainment from 
purely the legal side of things, but I think it's important to really just know the industry in general and how it works. Um, so for the entertainment side, I kind of know what the trends are, know what's going on, know, um, know the space. And so I would say, you know, do your research, study, and stay educated on what's going on in the industry outside of just purely the legal side of it. Uh, thank you all for your tips. Um, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, I have a few announcements before we close. Um, so the ABA Forum on Entertainment and Sports is having their 42nd annual conference uh, beginning October 1st and continuing on the 2nd, the 8th and the 15th. Um, this is the first time it will be virtual. And so if we didn't address any of your questions here. Um, they have specific programming for young lawyers. So we hope you can join. Um, if you have any questions for us, the um, ABA YLD Entertainment and Sports Committee, please reach out to us at ABA YLD ENT and sports at gmail.com. I hope you got all that. Um, and if you want to get more involved, um, we are always looking for um, assistance and we hope to, um, as, a, as a committee, we hope to engage young lawyers in this space. Um, we are so glad you could join us today and we hope that we see you at the conference. Hi, thank you. Thank you.